Well, hello once again. I'm glad to see you. Welcome to our online celebration. We have a wonderful service in store for you today. I have just a few announcements I want to share, but just really quickly, a reminder here that we're on our journey to restoration, doing the Tom Berlin study, Restored, Finding Redemption in Our Mess. Um, we're at the point now where we've learned about prevenient grace, justifying grace, cooperating grace. We're learning about sanctifying grace, you know, the way that God perfects our lives by filling the cracks and holes that sin leaves behind. So, you know, we're on our way to restoration for God's perfect vision of each and every one of us. You know, folks, we're getting down to the wire because we've only got one more segment after this one today. So um, please, you know, continue participating in small groups, um, you know, read the materials or just enjoy the message that gets shared with you during our celebrations. Next Sunday, October 18th, as a conclusion to this, you know, for those that met in person with our rally Sunday, we're going to have a bookend to that, have a parking lot service here as well. So make sure you bring your Matchbox cars or your Hot Wheels cars in their packages still because we're going to have fun with those too. But look forward to that next Sunday. Bring your chairs and bring your masks, and we'll do everything to keep everybody safe, but we'll have a meeting here at the church, weather permitting. So let's just have a short prayer as we bring ourselves together on this time. Dear Lord, thank you again so much for every person that is here worshiping with us at this time. I pray that they hear something in our celebration. They hear something in the music, the message, the prayer that just speaks to them, that encourages them, and reminds them that they are loved. In your precious name we pray, amen. Well, I do have just a couple announcements to share beyond that, too. Thank you so much again for your continued giving to our church, supporting our ministries through Realm or the gifts you send into the office. We do appreciate that. Honoring your pledges through the rest of this year will, will be very beneficial and meaningful for us as we do planning for next year as well. So look forward to more messages on stewardship as we come into the months of November and December. Online groups will be continuing. Um, we've talked about a couple Sundays now, an anti-racial group will be kicking off here, also Sunday, October 18th. Uh, if you haven't signed up for that yet, uh, please reach out to Dion Cottle or the church office. We'd love to get you connected because several people have signed up and it should be a very interesting discussion, especially relevant to these times. You know, we're talking about online things too. Uh, we've had several meetings and I've kind of grown to benefit or appreciate the value of being able to do some of these things online. You know, we always miss being able to gather in person, but having meetings online too has uh, brought a little bit of benefit of being able to hear everybody and see everybody there rather than having to sit around a table and try to hear people and, and being able to allow them to contribute in certain ways. So, you know, even watching Wheel of Fortune tonight, I heard that they've switched their auditions to online format too, and they've had some of their first people come through that process. And so if Wheel of Fortune can change, I think that we can change too. So, um, yeah, I'll admit, my wife Kelly got me into watching Wheel of Fortune. I understand there's a few others in our congregation too. So shout out to you, Leslie. Besides that, I do want to highlight the fact that our church is working on reevaluating our goals for next year. In light of our current situation and the way things appear to be slowly changing, it's going to take a while before we get things back to anything that resembles normal. And so our church goals for 2021 will reflect some changes to what we had in the past year. We had some wonderful goals set out and we're going to continue pursuing them. But in the end, our mission is to serve our community and to show the love of Christ. So. We're going to continue building upon that foundation as we reevaluate our goals for this coming year. We do have a special charge conference coming up just as a, a public service announcement or required for protocol for our, our district. Um, our district superintendent, Ichon, is going to be hosting a special charge conference Monday, October 19th. I think that's the right date. Oh, that's right. It's uh, this Monday, October 12th. So <laughs> thank you, Michaela. It's glad to have you handy. It's coming up this Monday. So right after you see this, um, you got about one day, but the administrative council uh, that will be effectively representing the charge of our church. And so we're going to be discussing an easement with the new property. We're working with the landowners there and we just have to disclose that fact that we're making an arrangement with them to create a joint connection onto Southeast Alley Grant. And so we have to just formally accept that as a charge conference. So. Be aware of that. If you have any questions, please reach out to me or reach out to Jamie or reach out to Josh Straw or anyone in the church uh, conference office here, and uh, we can help answer your questions there. With that, I think that was a lot of announcements, and I apologize for that, but uh, important things we needed to share with you. So we're going to move on with our celebration here. We have a message from Carla. Good morning, boys and girls. You know, this fall, it's 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 a cool time of the year and I love the season changes and again I'm going to say that's why I live in Iowa because of the seasons changes 
Today I was looking out the window at my other job where I work with a student um, and I was looking out the window and I could see the tops of the trees starting to really change colors and I thought oh what God has given us such a beautiful beautiful seasons where we can see the different colors and and see the growth and see the white snow we are very blessed to live in Iowa and have the seasons well, one of my things that I like about fall I talked about the geese last week I want to talk about popcorn my favorite snack of all is popcorn I could eat popcorn any time of the year but I especially like popcorn on a cooler night with the fireplace going and so it's I thought well that's kind of a fall topic so I'm going to talk about that today I want to talk about specifically my mom's popcorn my mom makes the best popcorn there is and I'm going to tell you how she did it it's kind of I haven't figured out how she does how she did it all those years she takes a little pan now I'm talking about a little pan. We're not talking about a popcorn popper or any kind of thing that's made just for popcorn. It's a little saucepan and she has a lid. And then she pours ingredients in it. She puts a little oil and then she puts a lot of popcorn kernels. And I'm, I'm not kidding you, a lot of popcorn kernels. And then she adds a little salt to it. And then she puts the lid on and she stands and she waits and pretty soon she can hear it start to pop and she starts shaking that, shaking it, shaking it and shaking that popcorn and then all of a sudden, I don't know how she knows, but she must know that there's enough done because then she takes a little bit out, lifts the pot up, excuse me, and puts it in a bowl puts the pot back down and finishes popping the rest of the popcorn. And she does that two or three times. And it's always delicious. It always tastes the same. I can remember growing up eating it and I can remember as an adult taking my children to her house and having popcorn and the kids would always request, Grandma, would you make us some popcorn? And she always did it. Now, like I said, I love popcorn. And I eat popcorn quite, quite a bit. And I was thinking about this the other day, how pop, the way my mom makes it and the way popcorn is, is kind of like becoming a Christian. I'm the pot. I'm the pot. I've accepted Jesus into my life saying, I love you, Jesus. I want you to be a part of my life. But I need ingredients. I need the proper amount of ingredients. I need a little Bible. I need a little oil or prayer. And I need community. I need the fellowship of other Christians to help me continue on my growth of being a Christian. And sometimes, as you shake me and say, yep, I've got a little Bible, I've got a little prayer, and I have a little fellowship with people, I'm able to spread that or take that out and put it in another place and share that with other people. But my faith needs to keep popping. I need to keep growing. So I'm still shaking and I'm still reading the Bible and I'm still praying. And I still need that fellowship of other Christians so that I can keep going. And that process keeps going. So just like my mother's popcorn, that's the way my Christian faith is. I start off as just by myself, but with the Bible and prayer and with the fellowship of other Christians, my growth in Christian be beliefs and knowing how to be a good follower of Jesus Christ grows and grows and grows. Boys and girls, my mom has since died. And that pot that I'm talking about is still in the family. And I have a couple of brothers that have learned how to make it and make it just right. And so when we go to their house, guess what I ask for? Hey, can you make me some of mom's popcorn? And they always say yes. And that's what we need to say 
Jesus, I need more of you. I need more of the Bible. I need more of my prayer time. And I definitely need more fellowship with other Christians. Boys and girls, let's keep popping for Jesus. Amen. Oh, thank you, Carla. I, you know your messages are always great. And if I'd known, I would have brought the popcorn this time because that would have been great. But I just have two words I needed to say to you. Honk, honk. <laughs> I didn't get to give you the heads up last week that uh, I want to just appreciate you for all you're doing. And if you ever need a break from leading the geese, let us know and we'll figure something out. But thank you again for sharing your, your gift of, of leadership and, and sharing the love of Christ with the children and with all of us watching. So. We now have special music, a hymn by Miss Sonny and Kara, so. Thank you again. The music is just such an important part of our celebration, an important part of our church culture, and so I'm so glad that we're able to at least enjoy listening to the music, if not singing along with the songs that we know. So thank you again for sharing your gift of music with us. At this point in our celebration is a time where we have a chance just to lift our, our prayers to the Lord. He's always there listening for us, but we have a chance corporately just to do that together during this time. You know, I think if you're uh, have read the, the chapter four, I have been reading along with this too. There's a lot of information in this particular chapter and I can't hear, wait to hear what Pastor Jamie has to share with us about it. But one of those in there shares the great commandment that Jesus prescribed for us. And he gave us a bonus too. But love the Lord your God with all your heart. But also love your neighbor as you love yourself. You know, those are fundamentals for us as Christians, what we're supposed to do. And so who do we think of as our neighbors? Who do we think of are the people in our lives that we should be loving as much as we love ourselves? It's one of the things that I would encourage you to pray about. And then I have a heavy heart at this time too, just for loss of, of life, not just here in our church community, which has been devastating, but within my family, friends, and, and other places where I least expected it. So I don't know what's in store for a lot of us, and I don't know what's in store for God's plan here in Waukee and in in the U.S. here with uh, the coronavirus, but during these times, I just wanna pray and lift up those people especially too. So let's have a moment of silent prayer and I'll bring us together after that. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, so many prayers being lifted to you at this moment. I don't know what I can add. As I do pray with a heavy heart and, and some confusion and 
and frustration and sadness. There's so much loss that I don't quite understand and maybe I'm not expected to understand for it's all part of your grand workings and part of your great design. So Lord, today I just, I pray for a lot of things. I pray for peace and calm. I pray for understanding and patience. I pray for humility and selflessness. I pray for spiritual discipline. I pray for our church. I pray for our community. I pray for our neighbors. I pray for those who feel alone. I pray for those who are empty inside. And I pray for those who are filled with false idols. I pray for those who are sick and hurting. And Lord, I pray for our families who are grieving. I pray for our friends who are dealing with loss. I pray for the souls of those who have moved on to your care. And I pray for the messes they leave behind. And I pray for those especially who are left behind to cope with those messes. Lord, I pray for courage to face new days. I pray for resolve to continue loving you and trusting in your plan for us. I pray for clean hearts as we make room for the Holy Spirit to consume us. And Lord, most of all, I pray for forgiveness. I pray for all the flavors of your grace. I pray for our salvation and restoration. And I pray that the love of Christ will always be at the center of our lives. And I pray the Lord's Prayer together with all of my friends, families, and brothers and sisters in Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we've come to the time of our celebration where we have our scripture reading. Let's see who the fall finds today. Thanks, Dennis. I'm happy to be reading the scriptures for this week. And I'm just gonna remind us of the overall um, scripture reading for Restored. And it comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind and live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. And the reading for chapter 5, Address This Mess, is from Psalm chapter 84, verse 5. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. And that's the readings for this week. Thanks, Dennis. <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing the scripture with us today. And thank you so much, too, for those who might find the ball coming their way in the future here. Be prepared to catch it and be willing to serve if you're able. Well, Pastor Jamie, we've had scripture, we've had prayer, we've had wonderful music, and we've had wonderful messages for all of us. Now it's up for you to explain to us God's role and his gift of sanctifying grace in our lives. We're on our way to restoration. Lead us there. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dennis, uh, for your wonderful worship leadership. And this is the this is kind of first class worship leader Dennis is he even makes house calls to the to the uh, person who's reading the scripture for the day to the liturgist so uh, Leslie appreciated that and we appreciate you for bringing us the word of God today Les. Um, well folks we're on week five of our six week fall congregation wide pursuit of becoming restored again into the persons that we have been created and intended to be by the living loving God. 
We've been using Tom Berlin's book, Restored, Finding Redemption in Our Mess, to help focus our efforts. And today we're going to consider how do we begin to truly address the mess in our lives. You know, a few weeks ago I remember reading a blog from uh, Reverend Bob Dean. He's, uh, he's a friend and a retired clergy in the Iowa Annual Conference. Uh, and he used a, a, a really good analogy that uh, we need to keep in mind when we decide that we have finally had enough of living with the problems of our broken lives, okay? Our, our wrong attitudes and behaviors, our addictions, our relationships, our broken past and our dissatisfying and maybe even miserable present. And we are ready to begin the divine work of cooperating with God to become free and whole and, yes, even new again. Reverend Dean wrote, If you golf, you're familiar then with the distance markers. These are either colored pegs or flat discs uh, on the fairway that show when you're 200 yards, 150 yards, and 100 yards from the hole. And those, those markers are there to help golfers choose which club to use to, you know, hopefully get their ball to land on the green. Reverend Dean said, uh, my brother-in-law Jack told me of a course that he played in Texas that had an especially long hole. Instead of how many yards it was to the hole, the sign furthest from the hole simply said, more club than you've got. In other words, it doesn't matter how far you hit the ball, it's not humanly possible to reach the green from here in one shot. Not Arnold Palmer, not John Daly, not Tiger Woods, and certainly not you. Well, I think that sign is similar to our efforts at trying to restore our broken lives by ourselves. Okay? It's not humanly possible. You and I cannot drive the hole from where we are. Only by God's grace can we make it. Reverend Dean then went on to, to call us all to remember that without God's grace, we would all end up short of the hole. We would all remain lost in our sin. But once called to new life, we're then called to persevere in our work of becoming more like Christ. Not to try to earn God's grace, but out of appreciation for and in cooperation with that grace. Now, the grace that God uses to transform and restore our lives is known as sanctifying grace. Through sanctifying grace, the Holy Spirit works in you and me, works with us to change us from one degree of glory to another, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.18. So it's important to remember that sanctifying grace is not a one-time event. Sanctifying grace is a lifelong process. And that takes time, obviously, and work on our part. Time where the Spirit continues to look into every aspect and dark corner of our lives and to continually show us, to shine light on, where we need to confess and repent of our sins and to continually to invite God's power and love to come in and not only begin but continue its work of healing and restoration. And it takes work on our part too, to cooperate with God's work of restoration. And we do that in humility and in honesty and in trust. You know, uh, I have been talking a lot during this series about my old Ford Explorer and how I did everything I could to get it running again by myself, right? And how ultimately, though, I had to listen to the wise counsel of my wife, Leslie, and call a professional to help. And when I did, voila! success. That car is now running better than I ever remember it before. However, now that the engine and the electrical systems and everything are restored, I'm noticing other areas of the car that I have neglected over the years and that are now needing attention as well. For example, when I, you know, finally joyfully was able to open the doors to climb in and get and uh, drive the now running vehicle, I suddenly became aware of something that had been there for years, but that I had neglected to notice before. I was alarmed 
at the number and the magnitude of rusted out panels near the floorboards, holes. Years of not washing off winter road salt had obviously taken its toll. So, you know, now I had to get out the, the navel jelly and the fiberglass and set to work on addressing these problem areas as well. As Reverend Berlin points out in uh, this week's chapter of his book, whether it's holes in the roof or shortcomings in our character, they all must be exposed before they can become fixed. Sanctifying grace works in the details of our lives. This is essential for both the ongoing identification of what needs to be restored in our lives and the upbuilding work of God that enables us over time to grow and mature in our ability to share love with others. Friends, in case you're wondering what the ultimate goal of the restoration of our lives is, well, please, wonder no more, because Jesus was very clear about it in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 37 through 40, where he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Friends, the goal of a sanctified life is for you and me to be able to respond to every person and every situation with Christ-like love. That is full restoration. That is a life that is fully restored into the image of God. And again, this life cannot be gained by our own efforts and willpower. We just don't have enough club. However, the good news is that there is someone who does and is ready and willing to let us use it. It's ours for the asking. As King David prayed in Psalm 51, then so should you and I. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. That sounds like the prayer of a humble person, doesn't it? Did you know that the words humble and humility both come from the same Latin word hummus, meaning earth? A humble person is someone who is well-grounded, okay? As a plant finds its life and its nourishment when anchored securely in the earth, so do you and I find our lives stabilized and growing healthy when we anchor ourselves in the life and the teachings of God's Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus' life uh, and teachings include what we call today spiritual disciplines, practices that if done consistently, honestly, authentically, work together to allow God's Holy Spirit, God's power and God's presence to work within us the process of the restoration of our lives. God uses them to bless us and then through us to bless others. You might remember John Wesley called these spiritual practices or disciplines the means of grace and identified among them worship, Bible reading and Bible study, prayer, Holy Communion, works of service and charity, and Christian fellowship. Now, it's critically important for you and I to always remember that even though we may engage in all of these spiritual practices or disciplines, these means of grace, the real work of transformation is always being done through God's sanctifying grace, through God's free, unmerited, endless and relentless love for you and me. So as we end our time together today, let me leave you with an encouraging image of that wonderful truth. In the uh, September 1st Upper Room Daily Devotional, that, that's a spiritual discipline uh, resource that our church makes available to absolutely anybody who would like to practice it. Contributing writer D. Aspen of California shares how, as a nurse in a busy uh, surgical oncology unit, she was feeling depleted one day. She writes, 
Slumped into a pew in the quiet hospital chapel, I gazed mindlessly at a group of candles in the corner. One flickered weakly. How will I get through this shift, Lord? I feel just like that candle over there, about to burn out. At that instant, the Apostle Paul's words in 2 Corinthians 12, 9 flashed through my mind, bringing me comfort. Paul wrote, The Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Wow, I thought. Our weakness elicits God's compassion towards us, not God's judgment. I reached into my pocket for a pen to scribble down my thoughts, and as I pulled out the pen, I also pulled out a latex glove. How useless it seemed. But then for some reason, I noticed my right hand, which was holding the limp glove, and I studied my hand's strong tendons and muscles, and I slipped it into the blue glove. The lifeless material was now filled with form and strength. As I opened and closed my gloved fist, I smiled, thanking God for reminding me that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I left the chapel that day reassured that God's strength and power within me, not my weakness, would prevail. Dee finishes her devotion by reminding you and me that God doesn't ask us to be strong on our own, to try to rely on ourselves, to heal ourselves, to change ourselves, to fix ourselves, to restore ourselves. No. As she writes, God firsts, first asks us to pray and believe that God's power is with us and within us, that we can trust God to fill us and to equip us for any task the day will bring. Those are words right in line with what Reverend Berlin writes to end his chapter for this week. As he asks you and me to Think of how many significant things in your life would become easier if you were in the flow of God's love and grace. Consider how much less mess would be generated if you made time to sit with Jesus each day. Imagine what your life might become if you breathed the oxygen of God's presence and allowed it to fill you with power, infusing your life with goodness and God's sanctifying grace. Friends, as Dee Crispin prayed at the end of her upper room devotion, so let us pray today at the end of our time of worship. Thank you, Lord, for the presence of your spirit and your power within us this day. Amen. Well, again, I want to thank you as always for worshiping with us uh, today, wherever you're at. As you go out into this new day now or into this new week, uh, may the Lord go with you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace now and forever. Amen.